We are meeting at a very special moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Most of us were not born when we attained our freedom. All of you who are studying in school today, colleges today, across the country, they're celebrating the 75th anniversary of our country's freedom. But do we really know how we got a country? independence the amount of work that went into it and what it really took and who were the people who spent a lifetime to help us attain that freedom between 1857 and 1947 in those 90 years, Indian revolutionaries, Indian freedom fighters completely transformed. Our country was governed by a foreign nation. We were a slave country, a colony. And to understand this whole story, we will go back in time. The date was 18th September, 1857, Friday, the city was Delhi, a war was raging between Kashmiri gate and the gate of Red Fort. This was the first war of independence. The Indian sepahis, they're defending the city of Delhi from being taken over by the British forces. It was a fierce battle. There was smoke all around, bombs, bullets, swords, blood. But Delhi had to be defended. India's future depended on it. At about 11 o'clock in the afternoon, the skies started becoming darker. And the people of, who were fighting for on behalf of India, the sepahis, the freedom fighters, the revolutionaries, they looked up in the sky and saw that the moon was slowly invading the sun at 11 o'clock in the afternoon morning. Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal emperor in the red fort also looked up in the sky and saw a solar eclipse. It seemed all was lost. The solar eclipse signified the end of their entire endeavor. This enterprise, the war for India's independence to remove the East India Company from the Indian soil was lost. The British forces battling through Kashmiri Gate reached the gates of Red Fort the following day. And finally, on 19th morning, Bahadur Shah Zafar, after seeing the events unfold, quietly disappeared from the house of his ancestors and left the city of Delhi for the outskirts and hid in the Humayun tour. On 20th, the British forces had occupied the Red Fort. The battle had been lost. Twenty-first morning, the city of Delhi 
woke up to the sounds of 101 camels. The earth reverberated with each camel fired from the ramparts of Red Fort. And each of those camels was sending a message to every citizen of India that from now onwards, Hukumat Britannia is in charge of your country. You're going to be ruled from thousands of miles away from London. The British have taken over your country. You are a colony of the British. Massacres took place in the city of Delhi and elsewhere in the country over the next six months. Villages after villages were burnt. Thousands and thousands of people were killed. And a military style rule was imposed on us. An ancient civilization was now controlled by a distant land, an island, a very cold place in Europe. And the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, became Kaiser Hind. The British Empire soon realized that India was jewel in the crown and the most important country to exploit for their own future. In addition to our gold, in addition to our jewelry, in addition to our money, they also started transporting rare artifacts and putting them in the British museums. The most important of those was the Kohinoor, which ended up in the British crowns and became part of the crown jewels, now kept in the Tower of London, even after 75 years of independence. So you can realize that it was a very difficult time for our country. And the British taxation combined with their intent forced famines on us. Millions and millions of people died in those famines. The entire economic system, the geography of this country was controlled by the British Empire. As days passed, they started impacting our education system. They brought in their own thoughts and ideas and they pushed them onto us. They wanted to create Indians who were like the British themselves. Times moved on. In the early 1901 or 1902, an article appeared in a newspaper, and it, very few Indian newspapers at that time. An article appeared in an Indian newspaper called The Social Conquest of the Hindu Race, talking about how the British were slowly and steadily controlling the minds and thoughts and habits of the Indians. It was a very well articulated letter, uh, uh, article, and it was very precise in its understanding of how the British, besides the political and geographical control of the country and the economic control of the country, they were taking control of the society and our spiritual ethos. Sir Teg Bahadur Sapru, at that time, one of the finest lawyers in the country, living in Allahabad. He read that article and he was fascinated by the words of the article and the style of writing and was extremely impressed by the contents. He rang up the publisher and asked the publisher, who has written this article? I want to, I want to meet that person. The publisher said the article came from Delhi. 
So we published it. It was so well written. We published it. So both the publisher of Model Review, the newspaper, and Sir Tej Bahadur Sapro, who was not knighted by then, but later on he was knighted and became Sir Tej Bahadur Sapro. They reached Delhi to meet the writer of that article. And they entered a small lane of nice sadak in a small, very sort of compact area, and met the writer who had written that fabulous article. He was a 17-year-old boy studying in Saint Stephen's College of Delhi. His name. Was Hardya. Everybody in the city knew him. He had topped every exam. He was the brightest kid in the city. He already spoke six or seven languages, and he had all, read every single book in the city library and the college library. The college professors. I had never seen a kid like that. Ek Bahadur Sapru and the publisher were extremely impressed. He recorded that he had never seen a 17-year-old person with such clear-cut views and such a depth of knowledge on so many different subjects and a mature mind. And a very morally upright person. Hardyal was going to make history for sure. He went on to study in Lahore. There was no master's degree in Delhi, so he had to go to Lahore to study, where he had American professors teaching him for his MA degree. In his final examination, he had to answer six out of twelve questions. He answered all twelve and wrote check any six. His American professors have recorded in their biographies that at one stage, four different passages from four different languages were read out to Hardyal. One after the other, and they went into his ears and were processed through his mind and came out in the exact shape. He had a phenomenal photographic memory. He remembered all the textbooks that had been assigned to him, word for word. He could read them actually backwards without referring to them. In 1903, he got 93 percent marks in his masters in English language. Unheard of at that time. He was the first first divisioner in the country. Getting more than 60 percent was considered a huge achievement. He got 93 percent. His name was published in every newspaper in the country. He was considered the brightest brain. Born in India, he spoke eight languages by now, fluently. By the time he was twenty, he was sent to Oxford. He won a scholarship worth two hundred pounds at that time, which is equivalent to about a crore of rupees today. He was from a modest background. He didn't have the money to go to Oxford, but he won a scholarship. He was the first North Indian to go to Oxford. On a scholarship of that nature, on reaching Oxford, he won two more scholarships. He appeared in examinations over there and topped them. The professors at Oxford had never ever seen a more brilliant student in their lives. They wrote his on his tutorials on his margin. They have written, "We can't improve upon Mr. Hardyal." He writes. Better than us. This amazing man 
set up a debating society in Oxford called the Majlis. His mind was faster than a locomotive. He could do almost 10 things at the same time. He exhausted the libraries of Oxford. He read 5,000 books in that period. In those years, when India was governed by the British Empire, the best job on the planet was the Indian civil service. Five to six people were taken in the Indian civil service every year. It was a very tough examination. But once you got through, it, they opened the doors to luxury, power, and money. Incredible resources were at your disposal if you became a member of the Indian Civil Service. For Hardial, it was a cakewalk to become a member of the ICS. He was so brilliant, he could have walked in. But he decided that he would not work for the British Empire. Instead, will work against the British Empire. He wanted his country to be free. By now, he had understood how the British were ruling the country, how they were using the ICS and the military service to control a civilization which was much older than them, much richer than them much more spiritual than that. Hardeyal left Oxford and became the first and the only student in the history of Oxford to have resigned his scholarship. He was a man ahead of his time. While he was in India, he had got married. At that time, marriages used to take place rather early. So at the age of 17, he had got married. He invited and with great difficulty took his wife to England to study at Oxford. And while he was at Oxford, he taught her English and other languages and history of the world. He wanted Indian women to be as advanced as the Indian men. He wanted them to leave the homes and live a life like a Westerner did in their own countries. In between 1905 and 1908, Hardeyal attempted a completely new revolution in India. He came back to India and set up a society. He practiced what later on came to be known as civil disobedience and satyagraha. He was the first who said, let's stop cooperating with the British. While he was in England, he was walking around Oxford Street in a kurta pajama and speaking Sanskrit. He actually wanted to raise an army and free India from the British rule and then take that army to England and invade England and teach the British Sanskrit so that they would understand that on, not only the world is one, the universe is one and there is no such thing as a colony and exploitation of other people. At this stage, he was just 2021. 20, he was making sacrifices. He was living like a monk. This is the uniqueness of the Indian system. A person who sacrifices rather than accumulates is always honored in our civilization. Hardial was one such man. Decades ahead of Mahatma Gandhi, much before Jawaharlal Nehru, and even before 
Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Pratyad became the most important man in the Indian freedom movement. By now, the British intelligence had caught up with him. They knew he would create trouble. Hardyal had grown up in Delhi hearing the stories of 1857. He knew how the British had massacred people across North India. He understood how this war could be won. In 1908, Hardyal's wife had a child, a daughter. But at that time, the British intelligence was about to arrest him. So instead of visiting his wife and meeting his daughter, he had to escape from the country. Because either he, they would hang him or send him to Kalapani in the Andamans. Ardeal reached Europe and England from there. And while he was in Europe, he started a magazine, Talwar and Bande Matra. And he edited those two magazines. He used the power of his words to transform the minds of the Indians, to create an environment in which there could be an independence movement. The British intelligence wouldn't let him live. They tracked him everywhere. They made sure he couldn't earn a living. They destroyed him financially. From Europe, he went to Africa, he went to Algeria. And from there, he came back to Europe and moved to West Indies to stay away from the British control, to go to countries where the British intelligence couldn't catch him. While he was in Martinique, a small island in the West Indies, his friend from Lahore days, a man called Bhai Parmanan, he was visiting that area. And with great difficulty, when his ship stopped at Martinique, he managed to locate his friend, Hardyal. Hardyal told him that he's spending his time meditating and thinking of creating a new religion. Bhai Parmanand convinced him that would be a waste of time. The best thing for Hardyal would be to go and fight for India's freedom. Inspired by Swami Vivekanand's lecture in Chicago in 1893, September 11th, which had mesmerized the whole world at that time, Hardyal decided to go to America. He reached Harvard. And in Harvard, he wanted to do a PhD in Buddhism. The professors at Harvard could not fathom the depth of this boy, 27 at that time. They said, there is nobody here who can help you in this subject. There is in fact only one person who can be your guide for doing PhD in America. And he's one of the brightest men born in America. He lives in California. He's Professor Arthur Ryder. Why don't you go to Berkeley and meet him? Hardyal went to Berkeley and met Professor Ryder. Professor Ryder was considered among the few people on earth who could start a civilization. He was the greatest intellectual of his time. He had spent three years in Banaras learning Sanskrit. He had translated the Panch Tantra, the Bhagavad Gita. He was an immense authority on the subject. He was also an authority on Eastern philosophy. He met the 27-year-old Hardyal. And he immediately wrote to the president of Stanford. The knowledge Mr. Hardyal has of Eastern philosophies is such 
that no Westerner can ever gain. He speaks impeccable English. He studied at Oxford. Stanford University did something which had never been done in the history of America. They made Hardyal a professor at Stanford. He became a lecturer for Eastern philosophy. This had never happened before. No Indian had ever been made a professor in America. In fact, Indians were not given first, first of all, equal status. Then they were never given blue collar, uh, white collar jobs. They were treated as the lowest of the low. All of a sudden, Hardeal couldn't order a coffee in a restaurant in California, but he could teach classes at Stanford. A dramatic event took place during that period. The British decided to move the capital from Calcutta to Delhi. A huge darbar was held in Delhi in December 1911. At the end of the darbar, the British king announced the transfer of the capital. In 1912, December 23rd, around 11 o'clock, Lord Harding entered the capital city of Delhi to unfurl the flag at the Red Fort, the Union Jack, the British flag. And as he made his way into the city of Delhi on an elephant, with 50 elephants accompanying him, the entire city of Delhi watching the proceedings at Chandni Chowk. Almost 5 lakh people. Somebody threw a bomb at Lord Harding. The sound was so loud that it was heard for 6 miles. It was heard as far as 6 miles. The man standing behind Lord Harding was blown to bits. Lord Harding was very badly hurt. He had to be brought down from the elephant and taken to the hospital. The British intelligence and the police system were shocked. They had 450 policemen in the crowd. They had another 200 people in Mufti in the crowd watching everyone. How could this happen? How could a person attempt on the life of the British Queen's representative in India? Immediately, a lot of police people ran all over the place to find out who had done it. They had no results. David Petrie, an in, a British police officer posted in Delhi, was made in charge of the inquiry. They researched all over the place. They couldn't find any. They put a price of 25,000. At that time, you could buy a house for 5,000 rupees in Delhi on an acre in civil lines. They put a price of 25,000 for information. They increased it to 50,000. Finally, they increased the price to 1 lakh rupees. Imagine, it would be like 100 crores today. Still, there was nobody found. In those circumstances, the British started making random raids all over the country, in Calcutta, in Kanpur, Allahabad, Lucknow, Delhi, Meerut, Agra, Lahore. And in one such raid in the house of a principal of a school in Delhi, who was a very respected man, 
they saw a big box in his balcony and they opened that box and they found a lot of material relating to the bomb attack that man was amit chand he was immediately arrested soon thereafter half a dozen of his accomplices were arrested but the man who actually threw the bomb rash pihari boss he disappeared he was never caught he reached japan in that box the british intelligence people found a letter an unsigned letter that gave the whole conspiracy away and the story of how this whole attempt had to be undertaken the letter had no name but the letter had read university of california berkeley the detectives identified the handwriting and the british police confirmed it it was the handwriting of hardya he was the master behind behind this whole episode david petri who later on became winston churchill's security advisor and head of mi5 in london during the second world war called hardyal the presiding genius of the revolutionary party by now in california hardyal had moved much further he had set up the gadar newspaper which eventually became the gadar party 50000 people living outside india became members of the secret underground anti colonial movement the largest of its kind on planet earth with its headquarters in california in san francisco and its mind by lala hadia of course the british reporter they sent their best spies to england from england to america to arrest her there but hardyal was always four steps ahead of anybody else by the time they processed the papers to arrest him hardyal had already moved on and become an american citizen and when it became really difficult for him his gadar party friends told him to escape from america and he reached germany by now europe was in first world war and indian army soldiers british indian army soldiers were fighting in germany hardyal met them in the prisoners of war camp when he was a student many years ago in lahore his professors had written His professor had written a song, and he narrated that song to the soldiers. That song was "Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamara," and he convinced all the soldiers to go back to India and become part of the Gadar movement. One thing led to another, and the Gadar enterprise became a global enterprise. most of the first world war period the british intelligence organizations were involved in curbing the gadar movement and catching hold of hardya a brand new organization was set up to catch hold of this man who the new york times called the most brilliant man in the indian revolutionary party and the most cultured that organization later on was named mi6 the history of mi6 is also the history of the gadar movement and hardya
after the war, Hardyal's life went through a lot of transformation. In 1919, he moved to Sweden. He spent the next nine years in great difficulty in Sweden. He had no money. He had no work. Nobody would hire him. He was teaching old people in a school for very little money. A man as brilliant as Ardeya. Of course, he spoke Swedish. He could teach in 17 languages by now. He was absolutely fluent in all of them. Ardeyal decided to move back to England and finish his PhD in Buddhism. In 1927, he moved back to London, and within a couple of years, he finished his PhD. That PhD on Buddhism, the Bodhi Sattva doctrine in Sanskrit literature, 90 years after it has been completed, is considered the finest work on Buddhism ever. For finishing that PhD, he had to learn another language. This time it was a non-existent language. It was called Pali. He learned Pali and translated Pali text into Sanskrit and then converted it into a thesis in English on the story of Gautam Buddha and his philosophy. He also wrote another book about his experiences in Turkey and Germany during the war. He became among the first Indians to be published by publishers in England. Hardyal was still monitored by the British intelligence services. They felt the entire revolutionary movement in India was being masterminded by Hardyal out of London. Although officially he had no no sort of overt position in it. But covertly, through his friends, he was influencing events as far as India. Bismil was his protege. Shaheed Bhagat Singh actually carried a picture of Kartar Singh Saraba in his pocket. Kartar Singh Saraba was part of the Gadar party. He was a student of engineering in Berkeley who had been hanged by the British. So the influence of Hardyal's Gadar party was all over the place. The British government had denied Hardyal any possibility of returning back to India. He never saw his wife and daughter after leaving India in 1908. For 25 years, now almost 30 years. While he was in England, Sartik Bahadur Sapru, who had seen him as a 17 year old person, student of St. Stephen's College, was visiting London. And he approached her there and they had a lunch meeting. He was absolutely amazed on meeting Hardya again. He wrote in the Indian papers that even after living in exile and living such a difficult life, Hardyal's intellect had only grown. He could speak so many languages. He was such a cultured individual. And the British had no reason to hold him back. From returning to India. In 1938, Hardyal was invited to America to lecture. He was on a lecture tour on the east coast of America and meeting all his friends that he had made during his time in California between 1911 and 1914. On March 3rd, 1939, Ardyal 
went to sleep in Philadelphia. He never woke up again. The world lost him. He was 54. Just months before his death, he had received the permission to return to India and reunite with his friends in his motherland. But that was not to be. New York Times carried an obituary of Ardhya. But the story of his death never reached India in time. It actually reached as a rumor a month later. Such was the censorship of the British Empire. Though Hardyal died, his dream did not die. Raj Bihari Bose, his friend and protege from his Delhi days, had reached Japan. In 1943, he passed on the baton to one of the greatest men born in India. And the third war of Indian independence after the Gadar of 1857 and the Gadar party of Hardyal, the third war, Azad Hind Forge, won us our freedom in 1947 after the Ayyare trials had tried to fall. From 1857 to 1947 to 2022, the Indian flag, the tricolor, our Tiranga, flies on the ramparts of Red Fort for a reason. It honors the sacrifice. It honors the blood. Our men and women, specifically young people, revolutionaries, Supreme sacrifices of the soldiers of the Indian National Army, the Qadar Party, and the Sepais of the Qadar. That is why we celebrate 15th August at the Red Fort every year. Thank you, Jehind. Thank you so much, sir, for such an inspiring talk. I think that was really very motivating. And the last part of your talk where you said that uh, from 1857 to 2022, when the tricolor we see in sight, the pride we um, get to experience, we owe that experience to countless freedom fighters who lived for uh, Bharat Varsh and died for Bharat Varsh. And even after their uh, mortal end, their dream continue to live in the struggle for independence. So thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful session. And I think uh, many of our young friends out there, they must be having some questions. Before we uh, open up the platform for them, I have a quick question which I would like to ask. Go ahead. Uh, as you explained, sir, uh, about the Qadar movement, and you very wonderfully uh, term the entire movement as a second war of freedom, and rightly so. So please let us know how the work done by the Gada Party and the network, uh, essentially led by the revolutionaries of the Gada Party, was kind of um, used by Netaji uh, to uh, mobilize men and create a struggle. So that is my question. So, as you understand, you know, the Qadar movement was outside India. Primarily, all the NRIs of the Indians living in East Asia, people living in California, Canada, rest of Europe and Africa, they combined their resources to create this global enterprise. Now, when Netaji was in Germany, he met people who had earlier been sort of connected to the Hardyal's idea. And then when he reached Singapore, Southeast Asia, Thailand, Japan, he again integrated those forces and united with those guys to create what was initially the Azad Hind Forge and the INA. So the, the idea of getting India its freedom had a two pronged attack. One was the Satyagraha and Ahimsa, which was 
sort of a soft approach. And then there was a hard approach, which was the revolutionary approach and a war approach. Now, some people just favored the nonviolent movement. There were people who understood that this would not get us our freedom. It would just create a diversion. The real effect would be to dismantle the British Empire, would be to actually convert the British Indian Army into a pro-India army. And that was the understanding of Hardyal. You see, you have to understand that Hardyal was an intellectual genius. He understood the problem better than everybody else in the room. And years before anybody else, he said, unless you convert the minds of the British Indian Army, you will not be able to get your freedom because they control us. So that is where Netaji succeeded immensely and the Azad Hind Forge and the INA trial were able to have, instead of uh, loyalty to the king and country, they had loyalty towards their motherland. And after that, there was no turning back. The British ran away from here. Uh, but they gave us a feeling that they had been benevolent and they had dealt very nicely with India. They actually stole $45 trillion worth of money from our country. That has been now estimated by well-known economists. So there you are. And all our you know, famous statues, jewelry, it's all in the British museums. You know, you can go and see it in England. Everything is stored there in front of everyone displayed, including the Kohino. Yes. Uh, very rightly said, sir. And uh, had there not been Hardayal in the scene, uh, it would have got very difficult for Netaji to uh, take the baton from Rashmi Aribos at that Janja and build a struggle of that uh, size and proportion. So um, this brings me to my next question. When we study uh, the history of freedom movement, and I have seen uh, there are students from class 6 to 12 uh, in our session today. So most of them must have gone through uh, history lectures in their school about freedom movement. But most, um, uh, uh, on most occasions, what happened is that the impact of World War I and World War II on the freedom movement is hardly spoken about. The international struggle that was going on, uh, Indian revolutionaries engaging with like-minded groups outside India, and such international struggles, I do not find much mention about them in history textbooks. So, sir, your take on that. What was the impact of world wars? Uh, the fact that they were happening at the same time when India was struggling for its freedom. So how those uh, um, situations opened up opportunities for Indian freedom fighters to um, take benefit of that uh, time? So, so very interestingly, two things happened. When the British Empire was fighting a war to save itself in England, they chose to hire Indian soldiers and put them in the battlefield and have them killed by people who wanted to take over England. So in the First World War, the same thing. In the Second World War, the same thing. Indians were being used as cannon fodder. Surprisingly, the Indian soldiers were world class. So their performance in the battlefield outclassed the British. A number of Victoria Crosses were given in the First and the Second World War. But the oath the soldier took was for the British Empire and the Empire. It was not for India. Netaji, after the surrender of Singapore, was able to see the difference between this very clearly. And when he approached the Indian soldiers, they saw in him a man, as they saw earlier, the people living in California, they had seen Hardeyal, the soldiers who had fought in First World War and become prisoners of war in Germany. They had met Hardeyal. They had all seen in him somebody who could lead the country. You see, one thing we must understand that period, the British were using the divide and rule strategy, dividing our nation on religious lines 
and on caste lines. And Netaji and Hardeyal, these are people who actually understood the problem better than the rest of the country and they kept religion and caste out of their system. So Gadar party had no gender discrimination, no caste discrimination, no religious discrimination. Members of all faith were part of the Gadar party and exactly the same thing with the Azad Hind Fauj. So these, these ideas completely dismantled the British divide and rule strategy. They could not, they could not enforce those ideas on um, uh, the Indians anymore after they saw that all religions were eating together from the same kitchen and fighting the British forces together. This was unheard of before this. It had never happened in the history of India. These were the people, they got respect from the entire country. That's why Hardeyal became a leader of his kind. The British actually have noted in their records, he was the most dangerous man they ever met in India. They've also recorded, he was the most brilliant man they encountered in India. And finally, every Viceroy has written to the Secretary of State in England, stating that Hardeyal was also the most decent human being you could ever meet. So th this is what India produced in response to whatever else was thrown at us. Uh, when I was in school, I read about Jaliawala Bagh massacre and Dalit Act. And uh, there was a simple line in the textbook which read that um, after the peaceful uh, Satyagraha or uh, when India cooperated with the British in the World War I, in spite of that, we were awarded with the Rolat Act. So that is the basic description they give about both the events in history textbooks. But after my reading of certain more text uh, books and uh, getting deeper into this topic, I found out that the entire movement of Gadar Party had a very close link with these events. So there was some sort of a fear in British regarding the uh, building up of this movement, and somewhere. Both these instances, uh, roll attack and the very unfortunate massacre, had some links with the movement. So, if you can elucidate on the same. Yeah, after the Gadar conspiracy, as the British called it, was unearthed, they, they wanted to completely clamp down on India. And the roll attack and the Jallianwala Park had its history with the Gadar movement. They wanted to send a message to India that we are your rulers, don't mess with us. We can do whatever we want. In fact, um, uh, General Dyer is actually not a general, he's just a brigadier who was um, uh, later on just called a general. Uh, he went back to England and he was uh, given a lot of money and a lot of praise for being the savior of India. Savior of India because he taught Indians a lesson of their lives. You know, this was the mindset you were dealing with. And no amount of Ahimsa and Satyagraha could have transformed it. They were willing to accomplish their ends with extremely violent methods. So unless they, this was turned around on them, they wouldn't have ever freed India. In fact, they loved the idea of Ahimsa and Satyagraha, for it didn't impact them that much. It definitely didn't cause them bodily harm. And uh, they hated the revolutionaries. And they were terrified of any such movement as Gadar movement or Azad Hind Fauj because that would undermine the entire empire. In fact, once they lost control over the minds of the Indian soldiers in the British Indian Army, the empire collapsed worldwide because Indians were used in the British Indian Army to control the British Empire globally, all over the place. So the whole world became free because they no longer had the support of the Indians to control over their empire. So th this, this is a very big difference between what actually happened and what we read in the school books. Uh, th th these are things that are eliminated from our system. But I'm sure now things are changing and we'll get all this back in our education yes. system. Yes, absolutely. And the fact that students are joining us in such sessions, I yes. think such talks would definitely provide them a window so that they can also get to know the alternative narrative, which is normally not present in uh, the history lectures they uh, receive correct. at schools correct. and correct. colleges. Yeah. Good evening, Please, sir, and uh, thank you so much for such an insightful lecture. Thank you. My question is regarding the article which you 
told earlier that was written in 1900 about changing the social fabric of india the british is how over changing the society in india can you elaborate more on that thank you sir as is well understood now that the macaulay kind of thought process was enforced upon us the entire senior secondary cambridge education was with english medium as being the methodology for controlling the minds of indians was originated by the british empire in india with the origin is in the british empire and and uh, nobody understood it that this was happening to them it took hardeyal to decipher this that actually we were being slowly made into a subject race and we would imitate the british and people who imitated the british the best or wrote very fine articles in the english language or spoke english like the british did or dressed up like the british or were attired and their whole behavior pattern was the british were considered perfect specimens of the indian civilization and he rebelled against it as a young man and he was able to understand that this would cause great damage to our country because we will never be able to understand who we really are and what our value system is and how ancient india was far superior to rest of the world in fact india has is much older than the english language so th this this is where he came from and he wrote about it that article is actually in public domain and also i have written about it in my book so uh, you can uh, read it uh, elsewhere also and you will see that a 17 year old mind is so finely tuned and so clear in their thoughts in his thoughts and even at that stage good morning sir good morning sir it was really great uh, rather amazing to hear from you about lala ha they are such a great genius so sir my question is that he was such a person who india wanted actually at the time of independence okay but still he gets a back seat why he is not uh, like uh, written much about like it is a, a great uh, to know that you are uh, selecting i have been uh, on your page and i have been following you you are picking all those uh, heroes those who are unsung they they are not giving much weight so why lala hardial was not among the frontliners in the history the his history, contributions the history books have been very selective the history books are actually you know distorting the truth right the wider picture is not presented properly only specific individuals and specific movements are over emphasized and this this is also part of the colonial legacy the british chose to tell the story of the indian freedom movement in a certain method and they wrote our history really and they they they, they talked about their benevolence they talked about how nice they were and how understanding they were and how they were helping indians to develop a democratic infrastructure so in doing that they had to eliminate the entire revolutionary movement because that caused them great damage and how they dealt with the revolutionaries is even more revealing it was it was horrific so uh, a man like hardeyal i have read how he lived there were days he didn't have food to eat he lived on boiled potatoes for weeks because the british were trying to financially ruin him they wanted him to die so this was a normal method a colonial empire does to anybody who attacks the empire it was a very difficult decision to take on the empire and then they eliminated him from the story of the indian freedom struggle primarily to show themselves as very nice people and secondly to highlight people they thought they could do business with so not only her they are thousands and thousands of revolutionaries have been eliminated from our stories from our books from our lives Uh, Shyam Ji Krishna Verma, Virendra Nath Chattopadhyay, Kartar Singh Sarabha, Gobind Bihari Lal. I can go on and on. I can spend this entire evening telling the individual struggles and stories of these people, and no Indian knows about it. Imagine Lala Hardeyal, 
considered the brightest mind out of this country, who scored the highest marks in every exam, who broke all records in Oxford and every university, became the first Indian to teach at Stanford, does not even have a lane, road, colony, school, college, university, scholarship named after him after 75 years of India's independence. It's a shame. And it's not as if I have gone out, uh, you know, not to and talk to people. I've talked to a lot of people about this at all levels. Yet people don't appreciate the sacrifices of these people. Kartar Singh Saraba. Read about him. 19 year old boy from Berkeley. His father and mother had passed away. His grandfather raised. He was sent to Berkeley to study engineering. He left that. Became a revolutionary, came back to India, was hanged mercilessly by the British. 19 year old boy. Bhagat Singh used to keep his picture in his pocket. He was Bhagat Singh's hero. How many young children, how many schools, how many colleges have been named after him? We have actually been very unfair to our revolutionary movement. As a nation, we don't value it. We have other families and people who, whose members didn't even go to schools and colleges and they have universities named after them. I mean, it's, it's just obnoxious how Hardyal has been treated in this country. When I started writing about him, I discovered that except the generations that had lived in his time, nobody else knew about him. Very important people told me, our grandfather used to talk about Hardya. One of the persons who threw the was part of the bomb conspiracy was Hanuman Sahai. His grandson came to know that I'm writing the story of that bomb episode in my book. They tracked me down from California. Then they connected with me. This the person was a 90-year-old man. When he met me and he heard that I was writing the story of the bomb episode and about his grandfather, he held my hand and he had tears in his eyes and he narrated his version of that event. For three hours, he did not leave my hand, a 90-year-old man. And he told me, I will not live long enough to hear and read this book that you are writing, but millions of Indians will. And tell them that my grandfather was offered governorship, chief ministership, anything that he wanted. He refused every single award. And he told the prime minister of our country, I fought for the freedom of this country, not for awards and awards, just to, so that I could see the tricolor fly over the red flag. This is the emotion we are dealing with. 75 years after independence, we have to understand that if India has to become a British guru, we have to reignite that freedom, movement, emotion. We have to feel for this country. We have to feel for our people. We have to think beyond ourselves. And I'm so happy so many children joined today because they, they, these are this is the future. They are going to take us from where we are over the next 25 years to our destiny of a global leader. As we spoke about the Jallianwala Bagh incident, so I wanted to know that was there any part of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose in that incident? I wanted to know as I am a great admirer of. So Netaji obviously was a student at that time. He was not not a member of the Indian Freedom Movement. But Jallianwala Bagh impacted every Indian. So many of our leaders they were transformed after that. They realized it's not going to be business as usual with the British Empire. These people are merciless and, and th this is not going to be an easy task to remove them because they, they will use weapons against us and they will massacre us. So uh, Netaji was deeply influenced by the events of that period and eventually all that added up. In fact, Bhagat Singh's trial happened in Lahore and one of the persons who was sitting in the audience was Subhash Chandra Bose observing the proceedings. So uh, we have all these uh, people indirectly or directly working together towards the freedom of the country.
thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Jai Hind. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind. Vande Matram, sir. Sir, uh, like you are an eminent speaker, a great speaker with who has a great vent for the emotions. I can see how much you are emotionally connected to our Indian history, especially uh, rising with the nationalism in India. So basically, the first thing which always comes to my mind is related to the syllabus, history syllabus of our schools, which we are teaching to our students. So what do you think, like what are your suggestions? Like this, uh, this is my suggestion. Like these are some of the changes which can be brought in the history syllabus. Like you said, these young students, they are the future of our country. They are the one who can cherish our dreams. So I just want, what are your suggestions for history syllabus in our country rather, I'll say. So my, my suggestion is the same. That were the suggestions of Lala Hardia. He wrote a book called Our Educational Problem. That a book is available in public domain. You can download it from the internet. What he said in 1919s, uh, before that, 1908, 1909, and then later on, the book came out in the 1920s. Uh, all of that is valid even today. For a nation to become great and become a world-class civilization, which we actually are, we need to identify and correctly identify our heroes, the women and men of this country who have completely and thoroughly transformed our country and our lives. Who are these people? If you look at the number of people post-independence who have been unsung, who we don't know about, we have never even recorded their histories, you will be amazed. The first woman IAS officer we don't know her name. Her name was Anna Malotra. Lieutenant General Sagat Singh, the man who led our forces in Goa against China in 1961, 67 at Nathula and entered Dhaka in 71. One of the greatest generals in the history of war. So we have to identify these heroes. We have to look up to them. We have to learn from their lives in every single field. We have had business leaders. We have had business leaders during the freedom movement. Some of you are connected to the Singhania family in Kanpur. And you will be amazed to know the amount of sacrifices they made how they secretly financed the revolutionaries. All these people took huge risks. At that time, the British could do anything to them. And th these are people we have forgotten because, in, in, uh, you know, in addition to racism in this country, there was economic racism. We were deliberately being kept backward. So are industrialists. The Birlas, the Tatars, the Singhanias, the Dalmias, all of these people were fighting to create economic parity so that factories could be built in India. So we could be at pace with whatever else was happening in the rest of the world. So everyone was involved. It was not just the bunch of lawyers in a certain party fighting for our independence and going to jail. They were the common shopkeepers who were, who were actually burning all their stock because they felt it was from England and they didn't want to keep it. They were school teachers. They were doctors. They were engineers. They were average people in society. They were making sacrifices. Of course, they were doing it without any expectation of reward. I've recently written a book. Delhi in the era of revolutionaries, 1857 to 1947. And I've highlighted the stories of so many of these unknown women and men. 
mothers and fathers, daughters and sons of that period. I've also written a book, India on the world stage. These are inspirational stories of Indians from across the world. There is a Bose speaker system available all over the world. That Bose speaker system was invented by Amar Bose, Professor Amar Bose of MIT. His father was a member of the Indian Revolutionary Party. He escaped from India and reached America. And all the revolutionaries from the former Ghadar party used to meet at his house. And this small boy grew up hearing those stories. And he created a post speaker system available worldwide. Possibly the first Indian electronic multinational, Indian origin multinational. So there are these stories, you know, and we have never ever exploited them or told our people. We have only heard limited stuff with the political agenda and that never helps create a great nation. If our country has to occupy a space on the global stage and be part of the United Nations Security Council and the which it, it will be without doubt. We are our next generation. We'll have to be armed with all these inspirational stories of all these people. People who took risks, people who sacrificed. This is very important. So uh, we are now going through the transformation. I'm happy that after 75 years, there's a realization. I get invited almost every day somewhere on earth to do a lecture. I can't do so many lectures. I can't appear on television. Sometimes there are three or four shows that want me at the same time. You know, it's, it's becoming um, uh, uh, much better than what it was. When I started this journey 30 years ago, people used to look at me and tell me bluntly, nobody cares for Netaji. Don't waste your time. Nobody cares for this Hardeyal. Who was he? You can't imagine. But there are other people also. There are people who went out of their way to help me. One day I received a video cassette some 25 years ago in the mail with a letter. And the letter was from a wife of a person, a British national. And she said, my husband has passed away. And in the will that he left to us, he had mentioned that this video cassette had to be somehow sent to a person called Bhavan Lal in India, who was writing a book on Subhash Chandra Bose. And this video cassette contains something that will interest you. And it does. It is an original program, film about Netaj, which nobody in the world has. So it was willed to me by somebody. That sort of stuff has happened. So there is, a, there is in people's mind a whole, uh, you know, a sort of curiosity like I have about these stories and all these people. And uh, it's only on the increase. I can see the, the passion that India has today for its own history it didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. It was irrelevant. I mean, nobody wanted to hear this, what I'm talking about. But I want to know what are your original and honest opinion about the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi? Original. Okay. Okay. I don't have original views, <laughs> so I'll just give you my opinion. I don't know what is an honest opinion. All opinions are honest, I guess, but I'll give you my opinion. So uh, Mahatma Gandhi accomplished a lot when he was in South Africa. He came here and he visited the whole country and he realized that there was another path other than the paths being followed by the, you know, that Congress party at that time, which was basically a club, a very high end club. And he converted that entire idea of India's freedom movement into a mass movement. So that's a massive accomplishment. But he put riders. He said, this movement cannot be just, you know, a revolutionary movement of that nature, the violence and all that. It will have to be a non-violent movement. So nobody had ever done that. Nobody could even think of, you know, 
that civil disobedience on a mass scale would eventually dismantle the British Empire. So he, he was absolutely original in that. And he got, gets a lot of credit. In fact, Subhash Chandra Bose was, uh, had a very unfortunate relationship with Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were at odds. And he was eliminated from the system and painted out uh, by Mahatma Gandhi and his support team uh, in 1939 election. Despite that, Subhash Chandra Bose called him the father of the nation. So as the biographer of Netaji, who was personally ousted by Mahatma Gandhi, I hold the same view which Subhash Chandra Bose, Netaji had of Mahatma Gandhi. I don't have a different view. So he understood that Mahatma Gandhi's movement would not result in the freedom of India which in fact he proved. So that's where we are. And uh, it takes a great man to understand another great man. So Subhash Chandra Post was without doubt one of the greatest Indians ever. And he understood. And even, uh, you know, when uh, the civil disobedience movement took off and Mahatma Gandhi became a force to reckon with as far as the party was concerned and all that, Hardial was asked this question. What is the real comparison between the Gadar party and your efforts versus what Mahatma Gandhi is doing? Hardial appreciated Mahatma Gandhi, but he added what Gadar party did versus what the current environment is, he said, ek sonarki so loharki. He meant that what we did required only one big action. What this gentleman does requires 100 blows before you can get the same result. So everybody understood that the problem of uh, the British Empire's control over India would not be resolved by Mahatma Gandhi's efforts. And the Quintana movement failed and you know everything else went out of the control. And since independence, we have not used Ahimsa and Satyagraha as a state policy in any, any of the situations we face. So that's where we are. But he wrote some very nice books about himself. He was very honest about himself. And only a person of a certain stature will be able to write about his mistakes. That alone makes him a great man. He also is a very good sort of international renowned person who gets us as a nation a lot of respect outside India. So we diminish ourselves when we uh, actually kind of create comparisons between, say, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, Hardial, and the rest of the gang. So that, that's not what India should do. Everybody did their bit. Some succeeded, some didn't. But we should not deny them their space. And we should not override one over the other. I've always felt, you know, uh, to praise Netaji, I don't have to bring down anybody else. There is no need to praise Hardeyal. I don't have to bring down the rest. There has never been any need. They were all great people and they always will be. But of course, Hardeyal and Netaji are the two people I chose to write the biography about. And my third biography, which I'm writing right now, is about Sardar Patel. So these three individuals, I personally feel, deserve most of the applause for what India is now. They were the people who made us free. They were the people who guided us intellectually. And they were the people who gave us the system that our nation appreciates. So in, to sum it up, you know, we destroyed the greatest empire human civilization had ever known. And we created the largest democracy in the history of humankind. This accomplishment makes India a world-class country. No other civilization on planet Earth has been able to accomplish this. So we should be proud of everybody's effort in that. We should not take sides. We are not politicians. We are Indians. Yes, absolutely. Um, on that note, I also had something to add. Uh, if we, uh, so if we speak about subjects like national education, how it should be, um, village reconstruction or social order, I think Gandhi has done a great job when. Uh, it comes to such topics, how a society should be organized. 
and when it comes to subjects like uh, the topic of national security or the question of how a country has to be defended then uh, i think what precedent netaji had set years back i think india is of course following that path right now so it's all about different paths uh, for different goals that's how uh, we must understand the subject we must not forget the work of dr bhim rao ambedkar also i yes. have um, uh, also read a lot about what he's written and his life incredible human being in absolutely incredible individual so you know these are people who may not be in the same political space but they contributed to this country and their contributions to this country are unbelievable also uh, sir if you can because we are joined by so many students today if you can let them know some of the names in history of freedom movement they must go back after this session and check out and try to find more about them revolutionaries who have remained unsung for a longer period of time like netaji subhash chandra bose like lala hardial so um, if you can give some more names yeah but i have many many names so of course shamji krishna varma virendra chattopadhyay m n roy kartar singh saraba gobind bihari lal these are names that come from the top of my mind then uh, malvi barkatullah mahendra pratap singh um rashbari boss uh so general sharawas khan general prem sagal colonel gurbakh singh dillon general mohammad kiani and ladies behen satyam that story is in my next book please read it the latest book i've written aruna asafan asafan Hakeem Ajmal Khan. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people. Why permanent? Of course, Lala Lajpat Rai. Just, just uh, incredible people. I mean, just the thoughts of how they lived and what they did make me very emotional. So I, I just keep writing their stories. And uh, in my latest book, I've written about sixteen such stories. Uh, okay. Principal Rudra of Saint Stephen's College, Charles Andrews of Saint Stephen's College in Delhi, uh, Professor Nigam of Hindu College. Uh, people, I mean, uh, you read their stories and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't hold yourself, you know, together after that. It's it's these are people who did whatever it took. Yes. I mean, there's a Satyavati College in Delhi. There's a Swami Sadanand College. People don't know what these people were about. We never told our children, our our school students, about these stories. Yeah, incredible, Arun Asif, an incredible woman. So we we have to go home and study this. We have to continuously upgrade us because this inspiration helps you in dealing with the challenges of your lives. Our challenges are nothing in comparison to the challenges we faced. We live, we live, and exist in a very structured world. Our careers are well defined. Our households are well defined. Our financial income is very well defined. I mean, the, they were living in totally different times—a non-linear life. Nothing was assured, and the threat of death and Kala Pani ki saza was all all the time, you know, all over the place. So th this this is uh, something we have to appreciate. Gulab Kaur, member of the Gadar Party. I mean, uh, I, if I, uh, you know, if you want, we can go into individual stories and it will. Sir, my question is regarding like what happened to the Gadar newspaper and Gadar Party after the death of Lala Hardiyar. So Gadar Party and Gadar newspaper continued after Hardya left America in 1914. Okay. And between 1914 and 1920s, there were a lot of problems for the Gadar movement in America. Yes, there was sir. a huge trial held, the most expensive trial at that time in the history of America. And Hardya became the main person in that trial, even though he was not present. 
Similarly, the Lahore co and Gadar conspiracy case trial in India, Hardial was the main protagonist, as well as in the Delhi conspiracy bomb throwing. So he was all over the place in every newspaper. Every, he was, uh, in fact, so important that Paramount Pictures in 1922 made a movie about an Indian living in California, running a organization to create a mutiny in India. And the name of the hero in the movie, which was played by an American actor, the name of the hero, and he was supposed to be from Oxford. So the name of the hero was Hardeyan. So you can imagine Hollywood was making movies about him and we don't even know him. And there were two novels written in America in which the main protagonist in what was Dayal Har and the other he was Chandralal. So major novels in American um, uh, and British uh, uh, space, you know, Somerset Mom wrote a novel about Hardeyan. So there you are. Uh, the movement, Gadar movement slowed down, became something irrelevant. There was a lot of infighting and by 1930s, it was almost over. It, it transformed into various other factions in America and Canada and also in India. But the Gadarites, the Gadri Babas, as they were known, they eventually became part of the communist movement in Punjab and they were hugely respected. And they were looked upon because they were 70, 80 year old people, 90 year old people who had lived in California, fought for the freedom of the country. So all over Punjab, they were really uh, appreciated. In fact, there is a Gadar Memorial Hall in Punjab, even now. Uh, this Gadar movement uh, uh, was uh, then uh, shut down in 1947 after India became independent and all the Gadar paperwork was given over to the Indian embassy. So now in California, uh, there is a Gadar Museum uh, recently redone uh, in San Francisco, uh, exactly where the office of the Gadar party was. I actually went to the original museum, which was set up in the 1970s. Uh, I went there uh, uh, much before the new museum. It was in very bad shape. Like all government museums, it was run by uh, civil servants who did not appreciate the cause and the reason and whatever else of the movement they were just pictures displayed and i felt very sorry that such great patriots would given up everything in california and spend a life in jails and uh, running away from the british all the time uh, were uh, completely disregarded but now things have changed and we have a new museum so that's uh, where you can read a lot more about the Qatar movement